get into the word. Say amen. amen. I've been looking forward to this since we came back from Kenya. And I trust that you will be blessed. Amen. How many of you are ready to be blessed today? First of all, I want to recommend the series my wife just concluded called, one of them is called Winning Your Personal Battles. I think there were some profound things said in that message. I want to recommend that. Please get that. The second one she just also did is, are you being pursued by, how did you call that? Selfish ambition. Kingdom pursuit versus selfish ambition. Please get that. Say amen. Now, my heart bleeds when I see needs go unmet. How many of you relate with that? Many suffer reje- from rejection and, it's, and it affects the quality of their relationships. Many have needs and they think they need a deliverance from some strong demonic powers. That comes from Africa. Some people have needs in Africa and they think, oh my God, some devil somewhere are really up against me. And that could be true. Many need money, love in their relationships. I see fears, insecurities, plaguing people. And I ask myself, is there a solution? Can you answer that? Is there a solution? Well, the answer is Jesus. But we have responsibilities. God has plans. So today we want to look at a subject I call reprogramming your heart for kingdom breakthroughs. Re what? In other words, there's already a program. <laughs> Let me start by telling you that there's already a program in your heart, in your mind as we speak. How many of you have heard of softwares and hardwares? Good. The hardware, in this case, is your mind and your body. The software are the things that are at work inside you. How many of you think we're pretty much programmed, aren't we? That's why one message sometimes will not change you. Because it doesn't change the programming that is in your mind. Hello, somebody. And I'm going to deal with some issues that would relate to you. How many of you know that if I said, how has the day been? What would you tell me? No, no, no. Don't, don't be jumpy to say fine. You will say things like, the weather is horrible. Talk to me. Now, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. How has your day been has nothing to do with the weather. You are either a thermostat or a thermometer. A thermometer sits down there and tells you what's going on. A thermostat regulates the temperature of everything under its control. Which one are you? You are a thermometer. And how did you become a thermometer? You were programmed to be one. Do you know how you get programmed? Shall I tell you very easily? This is from psychologists. Observation. I must say observation. observation. Imitation. Imitation. Repetition. That's how we get programmed. So by the time you are age four, five, you're already programmed. The programming has started. So marketers use the TV to program you. Let me give you this because I researched it. They said the easiest time for you to get your system connected is when you are relaxing. When you're totally relaxed, you're not even... You know, the young ones say, we just like the beats. We don't listen to the lyrics. (laughs) Be fooling yourself. Everything is entering your system and your system is sticking to it. Have you ever noticed they said that whenever they watch violent films, kids go and do violent things? How did they do that? Programming. Why do you think divorces are on the rampage today? Because people have been programmed to see divorces on TV. Immorality. I would say observation. Observation. Imitation. And repetition. That's how the programming happens. So if you leave yourself the way you are, you're already programmed. Some people's lives are programmed for divorce, programmed for failure, programmed for addiction. You know, you're already programmed. So if you hear a message 
or you come and you receive Jesus, but you don't allow a reprogramming, guess what? You will leave out the life you were programmed to live. And that's what is so burdensome in my heart today, to share with you how you can reprogram your heart, your life. Now, there's a whole lot of money being made from personal development industry today, but they stop at the mind level. Because the mind plays a major part, don't get me wrong. But we will go deeper than that. We'll go to the spirit level. Can I hear an amen? amen. You see, I used to leave people to their own orientation. You see, when you say, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, somebody needs money, and this is what he does. Lord, give me money. Will the Lord send money from heaven? Talk to me. If he does, it will be counterfeit. Can you see how foolish it is? But if that's your orientation, you don't know better. You say, I prayed and nothing happens. But there you go. Somebody said, you know, I'm feeling bad. So what? Everybody feels bad. It's not how you feel that matters, but what you do with your feeling. How do you respond to that feeling? It could be an opportunity to learn that something is wrong with you. That's why you're feeling the way you're feeling. And it could be an opportunity to react on somebody else and attack the person for making you feel bad. I mean, if you see what I'm saying, we've all been programmed. It's on record that many times when people have motor accidents, it's because they've just had a quarrel with somebody, and so they are feeling bad. So they go wreck a car, and they think, somebody made me do it. Wake up. Are you ready for this kind of message? Yes. I wish the church was fuller, everybody was here, but there you go. There's someone said, the rain didn't let me come. <laughs> thermometer the rain you know when you see the rain think about the desert places where rains are needed yeah. instead of telling yourself the weather is terrible I hate it when people tell me the weather is horrible because it's raining for one it washes my car <laughs> so I don't have to pay for that so it saves me some money for two I know that there's some parts of the earth where there's a drought so I'm praying more rain some people say it's a horrible weather and I'm like what makes it horrible hello what makes it horrible because it's raining you don't understand the rain has a covenant with God to come in his own time you have a covenant with God you do your bit let the rain do its bit if you're going to get under it put on a raincoat and move on simple stop all this negative programming programming has gone on for so long you're leaving out your programs Turn to your neighbor and say, this is a good place to be. <laughs> now, let me give you the scriptures we're going to be based upon. Then we'll take it. I have seven different points here. Yeah? But I know we can't finish it in one day. So we'll do it this Sunday, next Wednesday, and the next Sunday. Say amen. amen. So if you're smart, you are invite your other friends for the next one. <laughs> so let's look at John, Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1, eight. If you, you know, if you don't do anything about your life, you're already programmed anyway. Yeah. Is that not true? Yeah. Some of you are already programmed for failure. How many of you think so? You're ready. It's not a case of um, if God wants, if God doesn't want. It's a case of you already programmed. Satan. Anyway, I'll get to that later. Let's look at the scriptures. Joshua 1.8. Joshua had a very serious assignment, but for the sake of just laying the foundation, we just read verse 8. It says, this book of the law shall not what? From your mouth. But you shall do what? In it what? That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then God will make your way prosperous. Oh, for then Satan will stop your way from being prosperous. What does it say? Oh, I thought it's all up to God. Hello? I was a program. I thought it's all up to God. Say programming. If God wants it to happen, it will happen. Say programming. That's not true. He created you as a spirit being to control your soul and your soul to control your body. But when man fell, the spirit lost contact with God. So man began, began to be controlled from outside rather than from inside. Am I making sense? You were not designed to be controlled by the weather. 
The weather has nothing to do with your internal controls. Amen? Amen. You were not designed to be controlled by recession. Anything external was never designed to control you. But because of the fall, man began to be controlled externally. So when you get born again, you reconnect with God. Your spirit will take ascendancy, control your soul, and your soul controls your body. And you control these circumstances around. I know it's this far cry. You know, I was talking to a man, <laughs> one of my friends in town. I don't want to tell you what he does because you, I, you, some of you will guess who he is. He said, do you still preach what you preach, Pastor Kola? I said, yep. He said, but you know not everybody will be healed. Why do you tell them they will be healed? He said, you know not everybody will prosper. Why do you encourage them to prosper? I said, because I believe in it and it's in the Bible. He said, well, depends. So I said, okay, Jesus became poor that you through his poverty might be made rich. He said, I think that is spiritual riches. Then I said, that means that Jesus was spiritually poor. I said, but my Bible says on the cross, he was thirsty and he was naked. So he was also physically poor. He said, um, I don't see it like that. I understand that. He said, and also, I will not testify if the Lord blesses me with any material thing. Because somebody else might be angry and say, why is God not blessing them? I said, so you let them dictate what the Bible says, or you say what the Bible says and expect them to change. I said, that's where I differ from you. I said, but you remember some time ago when your business was in problems, we prayed over your business and you prospered. He said, oh, I believe what you believe, it's just I don't say it. In case you are wondering why everybody else does not say it, because they are afraid that you can get offended. Hello? I will say it. You know, it is on record that everybody who wins believed they can win before they won. It's on record. And anyone who didn't win most likely believed that they couldn't win or it happened. So before you face your task, the programming in you determines whether you succeed or not. I know I'm confusing some people here. Your programming is already messed up anyway. Some of you are just so messed up, you came to God to find it out. I don't ever think a lot of messing up has gone on. So we're going to program. Say man. I'm if you know you don't program in one night. You're going to listen to some CDs, listen and listen, change them in your car, change them. You just keep listening until the reprogramming begins to take place. Say aloud, louder, amen. So, this book of law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate day and day and night, that you may observe to do according to all this reading. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have what? Good success. And it says, but have I not commanded you to be strong? Now, you need to understand the, the, the task ahead of Joshua wasn't a joke. It was a serious assignment. It wasn't true. But we don't want to go there yet. We want to just highlight the scriptures. Now, let's go to Psalm 1. These are basic scriptures that would help you to understand when we say reprogramming your heart or your life for kingdom breakthroughs. Reprogramming. That means there was a programming. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Where do you get the counsel of the ungodly? From the ungodly. From the world. Just sit down there and the ungodly will give you their counsel. You know, we sit down and watch the TV. They tell us what to eat what to wear, who to vote for. Talk to me. They tell us if we dress in certain way, we're smart. If we dress otherwise, we're not. They tell the ladies what it means to be beautiful. Talk to me. They do all kinds, and they reprogram you. Now, let me inform you, those who are raising kids in this society, your kids are being programmed. They are. <laughs> Because you got programmed here too, so don't, don't be surprised. Psalm 1 says, walks, That walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But verse 2 says, But his delight is in what? The law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates what? 
To meditate here means to reflect, to moan, to mutter, to ponder, to make quiet sounds, such as sign, to meditate or contemplate something as one repeats the words. It's not just thinking about it, it's about repeating the words. It says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall also not wither, and whatever he does shall... You know what it means? It's a tree planted by the river so that when there's dryness in other parts, this tree takes its root deep to the riverbed and draws its own nutrients. So that's why this recession can't affect this tree. <laughs> How many of you think it's hard work to get reprogrammed? If it wasn't hard work, everybody would do it. And now is not the time to be distracted from what we're talking about here. This is the time to really pay attention and focus. Am I talking to somebody? Because it's very easy now. So, you know, I was just thinking about the other thing. You know, I have so much problems now. Don't f- forget about your problems. The way you are at, the, the issue about this kind of reprogram is not that you will not have problems. You will. It's not the presence of problems that makes you a bad person. It is what you do with the problems that either determines your promotion or your demotion. It's not the presence. Everybody's got problems. God didn't guarantee that there were no problems. Problems are for taking. Mountains are for climbing. Amen. <laughs> That's the attitude. You see, you, that there will be problem guaranteed. As far as this earth is concerned, it's loaded with problems. If you're on this earth, expect that problem may happen anytime. But don't let the problems be your defining moment. Be too much for those problems. <laughs> Say loud, amen. Now watch. It says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaves also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. But when you say prosper, don't think money. Just say prosper. Say amen. When people think when you say prosperity, you think money. No, 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 no. Money is the lowest level of prosperity. Money is the lowest. In case you think it's all about money. And some people say, all those pastors, all they think about is money. You have come to the wrong church. Money is the lowest. And you know, the person who says that is a slave of money. <laughs> they're looking for it all over their life. They're thinking, waking moments, they're looking for money. When they come to church, they're very touchy. Don't talk about money. Money is your God. That's why you don't want us to talk about it. But here we talk about it. Two more scriptures and then we go into our discussion. Um, Third John 3. Third John 3. Okay. Beloved, I pray that you prosper and be in all things and be in health just as what? Just read it in context. It says, for I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Programming again. The truth that is in you. Did you catch that? Just as you walk in the truth. Now, the truth must be in you for you to walk in the truth. That's why he said, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health. In other words, God wants you to prosper financially, prosper materially, prosper spiritually, prosper in your relationship, prosper in your career, prosper in your marriage, prosper in your parenting skills, every area of your life. So, but that's not true. Don't raise the hopes of people. Everybody say programming again. You know, in this part of the world, they say, don't raise people's hopes too high, lest they be disappointed. How many of you have heard that before? Don't raise hopes too high, lest people be what? Well, I will raise your hopes. And when you are disappointed, it becomes a learning experience for you. Say amen. Instead of saying don't raise their hopes, raise their hopes. Because without hope, listen, why should you study if there's no hope that you can pass your exams? Hope for the future is strength for today. So if I have no hope, there's no strength. So raise my hope. Say amen. But don't raise it on just flimsy things. Raise it based on the word of God. Raise it based on the covenant. So if I don't get the result, it becomes a learning experience for me to go back to God and say, God, what happened? And God can say, well, if he now tells me I don't want you to have that, I have something better for you. I say, then give me that better one. Say amen. amen. 
now, how did they get that programming? It's from some religious people. Don't raise people's hopes too high. Lest they get disappointed. No, raise it when they get disappointed. Let them go back to God in the word and let him teach them how to behave. Say amen. amen. So I just killed another taboo right there. Don't raise people's hopes. Why not? Let's raise some. How many of you like your hopes to be raised? You know, I like my hope to be raised. When they say things are impossible. I, have you heard of the four-minute mile? For many years, people believe the experts say nobody can run faster than, I mean, one mile in less than four minutes. They even had animals, wild beasts, chase after athletes so that they can beat that for me. They couldn't do it. And somebody came who never, he just had a change of attitude, that's all. And he beat the four-minute mile. And in recent times, <laughs> there was a race they did, a one-mile race, all the people that ran beat the four-minute mile. <laughs> so what was impossible many years ago is now possible. What changed? Did the muscles increase? No. Did they have a different bone structure? No. Their mind attitude changed. So stop all this, i got a big problem. Welcome to the club. We all have problems. Some of us make our problems stepping stones to greater heights. And others get bogged down with their problems. What's the difference? God? No. What's inside that? So I want to reprogram you. How many of you think you need some reprogramming? How many of you think, I'm cool, I'm fine. <laughs> Pastor Kola, you know what? I'm just cool, man. <laughs> I'm cool, man. I don't need no reprogramming. Yeah. <laughs> I can see why. <laughs> One more scripture, then we go into our series of pro reprogramming what we need to do. Um, I think it's Colossians chapter 3. Well, just stop by in Colossians chapter 2. Let me sh show you why you need to re reprogram. Colossians 2 verse 2 says, from verse 1, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. I just want to highlight that there is a spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, and it's not the Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? Yes. Now, let's turn to Colossians chapter 3. The spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. Now, how do spirits work? How many of you would like to know how spirits work? Once again, you have been programmed to say when a spirit works, you know, Gaspar, the friendly ghost, Ooh. So when you say spirits, you're already programmed to, to imagine that they are mythological unrealities. Is that not true? So you say, Ooh. No, no. How a spirit works, it comes to affect your mind. Did you hear me? Yeah. It comes to do what? And it utilizes everything in your past, in your nurture, in your nature, and your environment to communicate something to your mind so you can truly believe it. That's how spirits work. So spirits don't work in the air. I just felt the wind blow. There must be a spirit here. <laughs> you don't need any wind to blow for there to be a spirit. It will use your past Use your present, use your environment, and it will concoct, concoct everything together and impress upon your mind something. How many of you have ever experienced fear before? Even when there was nothing to be afraid of? That's a spirit. Your heart will be beating double and there was nothing to be afraid of. It's called the spirit of fear. When it comes like that, it paralyzes your entire system. If you don't have an internal system to rise up on the inside of you and resist that spirit, that spirit can wreck you. I don't know where Christianity went to in this part of the world. They just, you know what they made it up? Religious rigmaroles, externals, showy, regalia, garment. Ooh. But the real strength is absent. Hello? 
The real thing, the real substance, the connection of your spirit to the spirit of God. Can, that God's grace, his wisdom and power can be poured into your spirit. So your spirit will rise up strong and educate your soul and tell your emotions, be quiet. And then your body lines up. How many of you think if you think you have cancer, very soon your body will reproduce cancer? You know why? The control God gave your mind over your body. So if you were Satan, the first strike of pain in your body, I would suggest to you maybe it's cancer. You have no church like this to hear the word. You have no opportunity to change your mind. You begin to believe it. Your body begins to respond to what you believe. And your body will develop cancer cells. You see my problem here? You see why my heart bleeds now? Not because the power of God is not present to heal and to turn things around, but because many people are playing religion with the things of God. They're playing games with it. This is not about games. Jesus didn't die just to make you feel religiously happy. He came to set you free is what my Bible says. But when we don't know how it's going to work, say, I just love Jesus. Oh, he suffered on the cross for me. Wake up. He did for you to be free. Not for you to be subject to principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And they haven't, you know, they just have a field day because your mind is just, you know, some of you just come to church to come and fulfill religious obligation. You know, I'm in church on Sunday. Hallelujah. And their minds are so busy with everything else. True or false? As soon as the church ends, I know I don't have a job. As soon as the church ends, you know, we're about to have a divorce. As soon as the church ends, everything that they had before continues. And you wonder. Did you encounter God in the worship? Well, I had a good singing time. Oh, those guys were good. External. Did you encounter God in the word? A pastor really preached a good message. External. What happened inside you? Uh, you know, I was busy playing with children. I'm an usher. Ushers. I'm watching you. Do you get my point? What's the impact? So you go home, Pastor, you know my problems? They are very big. What happened to the church service you attended? Oh, I just attended church. Yeah, I attended church, but my problems don't change. No, your problems won't change, but I hope you will change. Somebody said, don't ask for the problems to be smaller. Ask for you to be better. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, this is not a get away from problem, run and hide. If you have faith, you have no problem. Who told you that? Faith was meant to be used in the problem. Faith grows out of that problem. If you don't have faith, if you don't have problems, there's nothing to use the faith for. Say, there's no job. Watch me create some. There's no money. You tell that to the birds. Go tell the birds there's a recession. Do they know it? My Bible says that God feeds the birds. So what's your problem? Go tell the birds, birds, there is recession, there is no money. Feed you, feed you, feed you. <laughs> I didn't know there was no money. I'm feeding fine. I have my home. I have everything intact. I don't know what you're talking about. My Bible says God feeds the birds. He takes care of the lilies. Oh, you have little faith. That means that there's a place for me to be recession-free. <laughs> Thank you for that. Amen, Tony. Some people are just staring at me like, which planet is he from? <laughs> He's from African planet. I'm from heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. Sent here with an assignment. To fulfill the will of the Father, to get kingdom citizens established in kingdom realities. That's what I'm here for. Is somebody hearing me? Look at Colossians 3. Are you there? If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above which Christ is, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on the things on earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is what? Idol Did he say God will put to death in you? No, you put to death. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of what? 
disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these, all these anger. Did he say you will not have something to be angry about? He says you put off anger. That means there is a response to your circumstances that is controlled from within, not from without. How many of you are hearing what I'm saying here? That control is not in the hands of God. You are the one to make up your mind that your spirit is reconnected to God and the grace of God will control every circumstance outside you that is not healthy for the reproduction of God's will in your life. I just summarized my message right there. Okay, let me leave the rest to you. You can figure it out. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man and all of that. Right, so what's the first thing? I said there are seven aspects to it. The first one is you must have an attitude of a winner. Have an attitude of what? So we now, I now want to do a research on the word attitude and what attitudes mean. And I found a lot of things. Oh my God, I wish... I wish I had all the time to just say on attitudes. You know, when you read Paul saying things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in Philippians 4, he was actually displaying an attitude. He was saying that, I have learned to abase and to abound, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know what he was saying? My external circumstances don't control my attitude. When Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind me, I press on. You know what he was saying? I'm regulated from within, not from without. And that's where attitudes come. So let me ask you, where do your attitudes come from? They come from your analysis of your own experience. Is that not true? Or the experiences of others. Is that not true? And then you make your judgments based on that, those things. So I went to research the experts. Charles Swindoll says this. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is far more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company, a church or a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past, nor can we change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We, can also not, we, can, we also cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is to play on the string we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me, and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you, we are in charge of our attitudes. Say amen. amen. Bottom line, you have a choice what your attitude will be. Say amen. You have a choice, what? And I'm telling you, have the attitude of a winner. You know, it says, I will win and not lose. I play until I win. Say amen. It's an attitude, first and foremost. It's on record that the reason why people lose their jobs is more attitude than, than, than competence. Psychology 101 <laughs> says to us that we, are pre we see what we are prepared to see. Did you hear me? Somebody who lives in a, in a suburban area was unable to find his best saw. He suspected that his neighbor's son, who was always tinkering around with woodwork, had stolen it. During the next week, everything the teenager did looked suspicious. The way he walked, the tone of his voice, his gestures. But when the older man found the saw behind his own workbench, where he had accidentally knocked it, he could no longer see anything at all suspicious in his neighbor's son. Did you catch that? So the mind was projecting that that boy stole the thing, so he suspected everything. So you see what I'm saying? Your attitude. Hello, somebody. Your attitude, I mean, there's so much here. I don't know if you have all the time. But I want you to know that if you don't deal with your attitude, it will deal with you. Am I talking to somebody here? It will do what? Deal with you. Now, what produces these attitudes in us are the things we have seen, things we have understood, things we've accepted. 
You can have an attitude of being very snobbish. You can have an attitude of putting off people. You can have an attitude of, you know what, I'm going to... You know what I found out? When you have an attitude of, I am willing to learn, people will be willing to help you. When you have an attitude that I know it all, people will draw the line and keep you at bay. So your attitude goes ahead of you. Say amen. When you have an attitude of, I, I, I believe God, that God will help me, the people that God can use to help you will be attracted to you. But when you have an attitude that, I don't care what anybody thinks about me, I don't care what me, 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 everybody else will be repelled from you. Just because of your attitude. Do you need to change your attitude? <laughs> it's not just your action. It's your thoughts inside you. What do you think don't raise hope is about? It's an attitude. When you hear a good message, you say, oh, well, he doesn't know my problem. Your attitude closes the door for that message to penetrate your heart. You know, uh, you know he's from Africa, so he doesn't know our problems. Yeah. And he doesn't. Because he's not like you. He's from heaven. Say amen. Yeah. You have the attitude. And when those attitudes are sending forth things in your life, you don't understand you are the one closing the door. That's what I'm saying. Have an attitude of a winner. Have an attitude that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on my, my, my mountains and make them, you know what, stepping stones. I'm going to speak to my mountains and they are going to obey me. There's more to it than just hearing words and acting. There's an attitude that is a combination of words and thoughts and expectation. It's something in between all of that that's called attitude. And I want to share with you that if you don't have an attitude of a winner, have an attitude that I'm not going to lose. Say amen. amen. And when you say I'm not going to lose, doesn't mean you won't lose a few battles. If you lose them, you wake up again. Say amen. The fight hasn't ended. The fact that somebody was knocked down in round three doesn't mean the battle is over. If he stands up before the count of ten, hey, the game is on. Say amen. You know what I'm saying. So you need to have an attitude of a winner. So how do you cultivate that kind of attitude? Well, I'll tell you how I cultivated it. I don't know about you, but I can tell you how I cultivated it. Well, I, I went through some, some psychology, John Maxwell books. It says, identify problem feelings. Because those are things that make you have the wrong attitudes. Identify problem behavior. So go beyond the surface and say, what triggers those wrong feelings? Write down the actions that result in these negative feelings. Identify problem thinking. That which holds our attention determines our action. Identify, identify, do a work on your attitude. Don't just leave it alone. How did I overcome some of these attitudes? I still have my attitudes. Hello. But you know what I did? Instead of using psychology, I went into the Word. And as I meditated in the Word, this book of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth. You will meditate in it day and night. I began to internalize the Word. I began to internalize the Word. I began to let the Word replace the junk that was in me before. Am I making sense here? You see, if you don't believe that there was junk in you, there's nothing to replace. That's the good thing about it. You know, my wife and I, you know, she comes from a healthier, in quote, background of mother and father and all of that, I came from a dysfunctional background. Hello? So it was easier for me to see how wrong my upbringing was. And it was easier for me to appreciate how right hers was. So when it comes to parenting, I take a step back and let her help the kids. You get my point? Why? Because I realize she has something to offer I don't have. Amen. And I tell the kids that. I said, left to me at age 15, I was fending for myself in my father's house, cooking my own meals, earning my own salary. I said, Do you like that? They said, They don't. So listen to your mom. <laughs> listen to her. Say amen. That's the truth. Why? I've not had enough 
attitude exchange or attitude change in the area of parenting. So God gave me a wife that has this foot, so she just does that while I'm still working on my attitude. <laughs> but when it comes to survival, mm, oh, <laughs> oh, you know what? Take my, give me my Bible, land me on the desert where there's nothing, and I will come out succeeding. You know why? That's what I learned to do. I had to survive. Land in Kano. A 20 something year old man comes and says, I want to start a church, and for all places, he goes to a place where there's 70 or 90 percent Muslims. He's come to kill himself. So you start a church in the place, you must learn to survive. You cannot be moved by external circumstances. You must. So I began to meditate in the word day and night. Can I hear an amen? I began, I, I began it before I came to Kano, by the way, because I learned these things on campus. I began to meditate. I began to do some of those things, and God helped us. Listen, it's hard work. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's hard work. Identifying problem areas. Let me go through those things again. Six stages of attitude change. Oh, well, I wouldn't say all the six stages because I don't believe in them. Number one, identify problem feelings. Number two, identify problem behavior. Number three, identify problem thinking. And number four, identify right thinking. Write on paper the thinking that is right and what you desire because your feelings come from your thoughts. You can control your feelings by changing your thoughts. Your feelings come from your thoughts. You can control your feelings by changing your thoughts. That's what John Maxwell says in his book, but this is what I say. Let the word control your thoughts. Jesus said something. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. You know what that tells me? Bread is to the physical man what the word of God is to the spirit man. If you let the word of God control your thoughts, not only would you have right thinking, your spirit will be built on the word of God. We need strong spirits. We don't need weak spirits and strong minds. We need strong spirits, strong minds, and strong bodies. Say amen. We need strong spirits. So listen to this very carefully. It says, um, develop a plan for right thinking. The plan shall include a written definition of a desired th right thinking, a way to measure progress, a daily measuring of progress, a person to whom you are accountable, a daily diet of self-help materials associating with right-thinking people. This is a general plan for attitude improvement. The following steps will increase the probability of your success. And you want to get it, get it from John Maxwell's book, Developing the Leader Within You. But the point I'm making is this. I will get into the Word and let the Word confront the true state of my heart and as I meditate in the word, my attitude begins to change. Is somebody hearing me here? So, back to my, you see I'm only on point number one. What's my point number one? Attitude. What should be your attitude? I'm a winner and not a loser. Say amen. That commitment will inform your willingness to change, to grow, and to improve. I'm a winner, not a loser. I will give my best, my all. I will learn my lessons. See, this is what that attitude will produce. I'm a winner, not a loser. does not mean I'm just going to be dogged saying I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I'm a winner. No. It means that I'm making a commitment attitudinally to learn, to grow, to improve. Why? Because I want to be a winner. Say amen. I want to be a winner, not a loser. So anybody who's going to tell me, well, you know, it's good that you have tried, you know. As long as I'm still not winning, I'm not satisfied. Am I making sense? I want to win. What does it take to win, Lord? Crucify the flesh. Yes, sir. What does it take to win, Lord? Adjustment in my mind. Yes, sir. What does it take to win, Lord? Adjustment in my attitude. Yes, sir. Why? I'm a winner. Not a loser. Am I making sense? How many winners do we have in the house today? I'm a winner, not a loser. I don't want to lose. I don't want to be part of the history of the statistics of those who tried and failed. I play until I win. Yeah. I may not become the superstar everybody will celebrate, but I'm still a winner in my own little corner. Yeah. Hallelujah. I may not become Mr. Multi-Billionaire, but I'm still a winner in my own little corner. Now, that's the attitude I'm talking about. That's the attitude I picked up long ago. 
We're going to find this thing out until we win, man. We're going to keep at it. We're going to keep meditating on the word. We're going to keep doing the things of God. We're going to keep obeying God. We're going to keep at it. Yeah, we will make mistakes. And we can learn from them. We will need adjustments. And we can learn from them. But that attitude must continue. I'm a winner, not a loser. Zig Ziglar said, if you want to win in life, encourage and ensure many others also win. You will win. Hallelujah. You see, how many winners do we have in the house? The first thing about winning is an attitude. You know, there's a Chinese proverb that says, when the student is ready, the teacher will show up. Have you, I don't know whether it's true. I read it so many times. I've never seen it in a Chinese book. Is it true? There's no, there's no. Ni hao ma. Is it true that that's it? Similar, okay, but that's what, maybe by the time you transfer it from one language to another, it doesn't come across like that. But what it says to me is that when I have a disposition of something, I attract to myself what is necessary for that thing to happen. That's what I'm saying. So, if you were the devil, what would you do? Would you let me have a disposition for negative stuff so I can attract it to myself? Why must you have accidents? Because you are an accident going somewhere to happen. Why must you be successful? Because your success going somewhere to happen. Just go to where God wants you to go and succeed. Amen. So attitude one, point number one, have an attitude of a winner. What does it imply? It means you are making a commitment and you will be willing to change, willing to grow, willing to improve, and you will give your best. Because you don't win by just saying I'm a winner. You don't win by sitting down doing nothing. You give your best. You make the adjustment. You don't look to yourself as if you have arrived. You look to yourself as, like what we say, something in progress. Sight under construction. You're moving on. You want to win. I, I'm, hey, I'm not planning for church to fail. Hello? Recession has nothing to do with success that we are talking about. Hello? Oh, well, you know, they say there's recession. Who said so? Well, all the facts are there. Oh, really? Mm, mm. There is recession. Did you hear that there was recession in the 90s? Hello? There was. Many of the recessions were predicted. And in every recession, there were those who were poor and those who made money in the recession. So what made the difference? The people. So which, one are, which side are you going to be on? Well, your attitude will tell me which side you're on. <laughs> you know, it's such a recession. No, don't get me wrong. In recession, you cut down and a few excesses here and there. You know what I'm saying? But do you let that become your inner working programming? No. 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 Why? Listen. You cannot afford to be regulated externally if you're going to be a winner. The God of this world, the spirit working children of disobedience has already programmed the whole world for as many people to fail as he can. You have to decide you're not one of them. Am I making sense? You have to decide you're not. That's all. That's all I'm saying. That's your attitude right there. You have to decide. I made the decision. Are there failures in ministry? Plenty. Are there failures in marriage? Plenty. Are there failures in finances? Plenty. I just decided, not me. And I'm asking you to do the same thing. Not you. Say, so, but will my decision change anything? By God, it will change everything. Not just anything. Everything. Why? You were never designed. When God created Adam, he made him last. So that what he put in Adam can regulate every other thing he had created. He didn't design for things to regulate Adam. He designed for Adam to regulate things. You get my point? When man fell, external began to regulate man. When you are recreated back in... That's why Jesus, when he was on earth, when he needed to walk on water, the thing congealed under him and carried his weight. <laughs> Am I talking here? <laughs> 
You know, that's, that's what he's trying to let you understand. Man was not to be subject to circumstances and situations. Circumstances and situations are meant to be subject to man. That's why you have a choice of how to feel about something, how to think about something. What choices you make concerning the thing will determine how that thing will turn out in your life, whether for your downfall or for your uprising. It's a choice. If you didn't have that choice, nobody should blame you for making the choices. When God's judgment day comes, when the Bible says we should all be judged for what we did in the flesh. Listen, if we had no choice and we all had to re react to everything around us, there'll be no basis for judgment. Think about it. Look at what he says. He says, don't be angry. Don't let Lord wrath. That means that there'll be things that will make you angry, but you choose not to be. And if you are angry, you choose not to act upon your anger. <laughs> Who is in control now? The devil? Inside you. You will make your way prosperous. You will have good success. What's going to give you the strength? This book of the law shall not depart. You will internalize it. You will meditate on it. You will speak it to yourself. You will reprogram the system that you have. And then that program will begin to speak on your behalf. Somebody insults you. Who do they think they are? How can they talk to me like that? You're just showing your programming again. Somebody insults you. So what? Welcome to the club. Person has a right to their opinion. You have a right to your choice of action. The word responsibility means I am responsible for how I respond to anything. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> This is too heavy for you. So let's go quickly to the second point and we'll stop with that one. Number two, understand the tools that God operates by. Understand what? The tools that God operates by. How many of you believe that God operates by miracles? No. God doesn't operate by miracles. God operates by his word. It is only when he has to confirm his word he does a miracle. You say, well, where did you get that? How many of you know that when God called Moses and he told him what to go and do, when Moses said, how will they believe that you sent me? It was when God said, what is in your hand? Is that not true? Yes. And he said, throw it down and it became a snake. In other words, the miracle element was to convince the unbelievers. But God's primary way of operating is by his word. <laughs> you say, but how are we going to believe that? Well, Jeremiah 1.12 says, he watches over what? His word to perform it. You know what that tells me? Some of us want God to do a miracle. True or false? Well, listen to how he operates. He operates by confirming his word. So which word are you standing on for the miracle you expect? <laughs> no word, no miracle. And how many of you have been frustrated with that kind of thing? You see, God, I've been, believe, I've been asking you to do it. That's fine, I want to do it. But there's a way I operate. I operate by my word, and when my word is put out, in faith, I do the miracle. Hello? So if as a believer, I don't understand the tools that God operates by. You know, Mark, Mark, Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all the things shall be what? Have you ever meditated on that scripture? He said, the things that will be added to you are the things that the Gentiles seek, right? That means that success is not what I pursue. Success is what I become. Then it attracts the things to me. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't hear that. <laughs> you know, it says the Gentiles seek after. But you seek first what? And it's what? And every other thing shall be? So what they are looking for will be attracted to me. I'm sure you didn't hear that. Should I say that one more time? <laughs> Seek ye first the 
and his, his righteousness. And all the things shall be what? But before then he had said, these are the things that the Gentiles... So, it means to me like, I should not be seeking what they are seeking. I should be seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, thereby the things they are seeking will be... So it's a change of order now, isn't it? So, what that means in Amplified, it says, seek first the kingdom of God is right. God's ways of doing things. God's ways of being right. Now, how does God's way of being, what does it mean? That's what we talked about here in the word. God's way of being right. So, I need a miracle. So, the next question I should ask myself is, what word am I acting on? What word? What word is God going to work on to produce his miracle in that situation. If I don't have any word, I have not sought first the kingdom and his righteousness, his way of operating. You remember in Mark 16, he says, and the Lord confirmed the word with what? Signs following. That means the miracle follows the word. You catch it? So what shall I spend my time in? So that the miracles can. <laughs> so when they are preaching the word and I'm too busy to listen. I'm too busy to invest in the word. I'm too busy to listen to CDs. I'm too busy to spend time in the word. And I'm saying, oh God, why is this happening to me? Slap, slap. Are you seeing my point? I'm too busy. God knows I'm very busy. I work from morning till night. I have no time to pray. I have no time to read the word. And God, you know I'm suffering for you. Am I talking here? Am I talking here? Listen, guys, if you don't know how he operates, it is not his fault, it's yours. Take responsibility for that. I told you the first thing is that the second know your tools. Know the tools he operates by. He operates by his word. In that place we read in 3 John 2, you know what he says? He said, I like the fact that you are walking in the truth and the truth is in you. That is why he can pray the prayer. I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. Even what? As your soul prospers. Not all the truth in you will make your soul prosper. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. So if I put the word in me that says forgive, when my emotions are stirred up to retaliate, the word controls that. When I put the word in me that says think like this, when a thought comes to me that is contrary, the word controls that. What am I doing? I'm bringing the government of his kingdom upon my soul so that when the things happen, my soul is regulated from within, not from without. That is called reprogramming. Some say you are being false, you are being fake, you are pretentious. That's your problem. I'm going through process to come to the place where thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth. That is it. So faith will be a normal process. It's not something I struggle for. No. Because it comes by what? Hearing by the word of God. So when I begin to, listen, I take my soul. I say, soul, you know what? You've been programmed wrongly. You've been programmed to covet You've been programmed to be proud. You've been programmed to be selfish. You've been programmed wrongly. And by the way, how do you know you're programming? By your crisis. Your crisis were meant to show you what your programming is about. But you see your crisis and say, God has left me. Why did God let this happen to me? If God, if God really lost me, right? No, 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 no. Your programming is revealed to you. God. That's why my wife, as I told you to take the messages she's preached, she was saying that, when God led them through the wilderness, is so that he can show them what is in their own heart. Your crisis is meant to show you what's in your heart. Your own crisis is to show you what. So what crisis do you have today? Well, my wife doesn't love me. What seeds have you been sowing? Oh, I thought, I thought she should love me because she's a Christian. I know. But what seeds have you been sowing? It's called take responsibility. But it, makes, it takes two to tango. I know that. That's why she's in church too. <laughs> Amen. I know. I know it takes two to tango. 
But what seeds have you been sowing? What do I see when I read the Bible? I don't just see letters. I don't just see stories. I see insights as to how my life should be in alignment with the word. And when I say my life, I'm not talking external. I'm talking internal. Emotions, will, thoughts, all the dimension, my imagination. I want to harness them to be in line with the word. Why? Because that is what it means to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And every other thing shall be what? When it gets added, is that when we say you have an attitude and then the right people come your way. Your attitude will not drive them away because you have the right attitude in the first place. (laughs) Then you have your mind made up. Say amen, somebody. Are you receiving anything out of this? So what does God do? Do you know what I found out? Everything we're asking for is a harvest. The question is, is, where's the seed? Tell me what our prayer points are. Talk to me, anything. Just mention them. What are we praying about in our personal lives? I need money. Everybody say harvest. I need healing. Everybody say harvest. Relationship, everyone say harvest. Harvest. Future, Future. say harvest. Genesis 8.22 says, seed time and harvest time shall never cease. It says as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall never stop. You know what that tells me? What is it that I found out in the word of God? Jesus was preaching in the parable of the sower. He said, the sower soweth what? And what is the seed? When a sower goes to sow, what does he expect? So he sows it on stony ground, sows it on wayside, sows it on thorny ground, sows it on good soil. Hello? That means that when Jesus comes into a church like this, he sees what the people are praying about. Watch this. I want relationship healing. I want relationship this. I want finances. I, you know what he comes? He sows the seed. Say man. He sows what? Why? Because the answers to their prayers are the harvest that they need. Are you seeing the, how it figures out? I don't know what you're praying about. I need to be healed. Harvest. I need to be delivered. Harvest. Everything I want is there. And the seed is the word. (laughs) The seed is the word. I'm talking from experience. I hope you know what I'm talking about. Literally, let me tell you what I'm doing in this message. I'm showing you my life. Practically. That's what I'm doing. That's what led to all this. The seed is the word. Everybody say the seed is the word. You see, your Bible is a bag of seeds. Fancy me giving you a whole bag of seeds. Your heart is the soil. Watch. And then you carry your bag of seeds. And you say, I wonder why I have no harvest. I wonder why I have no harvest. God, give me a harvest. I wonder why I have no harvest. Oh, God, am I sinning against you? Oh, God, please do something. Okay, don't raise your hopes too high. I wonder how I have no harvest. You know, I God, please now. Okay, I don't want to ask for things you don't want to give me. The seed. The seed is the word of God. Say with me, the seed is the word. word. Say with me one more time, the seed is the word. word. Doesn't mean if you have the seed, you have problems. You have problems. Planting it and tilling the ground and finding the space to put it is a whole lot of problem itself, you know. Doesn't mean you have challenges. Oh, Forget it. This is not about not having challenges. This is about preparing you for the challenges that will come. The seed is the word of God. So, this book of the Lord shall not depart of your mouth. You met it day and night. What do you think he's trying to tell you? Plant the seed. Replace the junk that was in your soul. Reprogram your mind. Some things have been programmed wrongly. Reprogram them. So that the seed can find place in your heart. Why is he say that these things they ask for will be added? Because when your heart becomes fruitful, oof, are you catching something? When your heart becomes fruitful, they will be added. They will be added. Am I talking here? I said they will be what? 
Now, let me give you a practical thing. What if I was not a preacher and I was a businessman? Because some say, you know, as a preacher, people can just give you money. Listen, 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 listen close. Listen real good. People don't just give you money. They give you in response to what they have received. Did you hear that? So don't ever think, you know, I'm living by faith. You're doing nothing. You're not blessing anybody. And just I'm living by faith, waiting for somebody to come and give you a handout. That is a wrong spirit. Somebody heard a message. It turned their life around. They cannot measure money to it. It is priceless. So they said, please, man of God, take a few thousands just for your good. You have been a blessing. And you say they just gave me money. They didn't just give me money. They responded to something. Now, if I was a businessman and I'm not a preacher, you know what will happen? God will give me divine ideas. <laughs> and with my divine ideas, God will attract the right people to me and then we'll come together in a business environment and everything we set our hands to do will prosper. Why? The soul is in there. The seed is there. Am I making sense? So what is that seed going to do? Number one, it's going to reprogram you. Number two is going to get into your heart. And number three, the Bible says your heart is the production center. Guard your heart, Proverbs 4, with all diligence, for out of it comes what? what? Your heart is a production center. You don't, have what, you don't like what you're experiencing, change the seed you're planting. Oh, but we need immediate solutions to our problems. We don't need, you know, long term. When you plant the seed, it takes a long time for the seed to come up. That's the problem I have with you. Your problem did not start suddenly. Your problem has been around for a long time. Do you want a real solution or a makeshift solution? This is the real one. The others are makeshift. Oh, we can have corporate faith and believe God for you to have an immediate miracle. But if you still don't change the seed program in your heart, you're still going to come back to the same problem. Yeah. I would say the seed is the word. The seed is the That's how God works. God is your source. Amen? Well, what seeds are you planting? Now you can see why the devil has programmed people like that. You can see why the word of God has no effect. He sits down, you sit down in your room, your bedroom, your sitting room, and you just put on the TV, and you watch soaps, you watch dramas, you watch films, and they are all full of intrigues and, and murder and immorality and all that stuff, and you're saying, you know, I don't just watch it, I just like the lyric, no, I like the beats. Yeah, okay. Now your system doesn't know the difference, so it's just absorbing whatever you're exposed to. Say, man, absorbing what? So when it comes to divorce, your system says, oh, everybody divorces. Where did you get that from? Programming. When it comes to learning everything, who do you think you are to tell me who I am? Pride. You got that from programming. Everything just comes through like that. And then you come to church on Sunday. Oh, God. Oh, God. Do something, Lord. God says, what do I need to do? He comes around. He can't see his word. He can't see his seed on the ground. He has nothing to confirm. There's no word of his to confirm. He says, I am limited in your life because there's no seed in the ground. Oh. Can I preach this hard enough? Or oh, you've got the message. Have you got the message? There's no seed in the ground. Who is entitled? Who has the responsibility to plant the seed? You. Seed on marital prosperity. Seed on financial. Seed on this. Say, but are we all meant to just live on earth? No, 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 no. God left you on this earth to showcase his goodness on the earth. If he wanted you in heaven immediately, he would have taken you away fast. Am I making sense? So you are here for a reason. The seed is the word of God. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Write Genesis 8, 22 down. Uh, let me now deal with this. Number four. When things go consistently bad, you need deliverance. <laughs> when things go what? Consistently bad. You need what? 
And this is where I have another problem. Some would believe that deliverance is only a uh, power encounter and truth encounter. Say that one more time. Power encounter, truth encounter. When things go bad consistently and you've done everything I've said so far and nothing is changing, you need deliverance. Say amen. But the deliverance you need is in twofold. The first one will be a power encounter. Any one you have first, doesn't matter. But one that is important is a truth encounter. Let me tell you. John chapter 8 and verse 32. John chapter 8 and verse what? 32. I will stop at this point so that we can continue on Wednesday. Are you going to be in church on Wednesday? Yes. You better be. Then next Sunday we'll be rounding it all up. Say amen. amen. Because we want to make sure that you have the reprogramming going on for you. Now John 8 verse 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? No, no, it didn't say set, it says make you free. There's a difference between being set free and being made free. A lot of people think setting free is what it says. No, it says being made free. There's a making. You see, truth demands process. Say with me, truth Truth. demands Demands. process. process. Now watch. It says... In verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, they already believed him. He says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Make, not set you free. Make you free. Now, you see, when you are set free, it's power encounter. When you are made free, it's truth encounter. Did you hear me? If somebody has some real demonic situations and we say, in the name of Jesus, lose your grip, you foul spirit, and be gone. And the thing happens, boom, the person is set free. Right? But that same person needs to be made free. Because the programming in the mind does not change because the demons left. Am I making sense? The making free is the reprogramming of truth inside you. That's what makes you free. Say amen. You will continue in my word and you will know the truth and the truth you know will make you free. For you to see what they were saying, they says they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and we have never been in bondage to anyone. You will, who, how can you say you'll be made free? Jesus and the nurse says, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. In other words, sin works with a program. When the program of sin is at work in your soul, you will be a slave of sin. Case in point, I've just come from work and I'm tired, programming, relaxed beside, behind the television. How many of you know that's a program? What is the easiest way to relax? TV. Where did you learn that from? I was say programming. If you're into alcohol, what's the easiest way to relax? A glass of wine. Programming. What else are you into? <laughs> sleep <laughs> now sleep it has a good part but you can do it too much all I'm saying is that the programming that leads to the activity is what truth comes to replace to make you free you get my point that programming oh you know you've had a hard day today you need to really relax bam to TV your wife is talking to you, you're not listening. <laughs> Nowadays, it's internet. Yeah. Oh, dear Lord. That has addiction. Do you know that? Yeah. I've gone from one iPad. I won't tell you how many iPads I have now. <laughs> it's mental. <laughs> iMac, iPad, iPhone, i this, i that, i you. <laughs> It's mental. I mean, one sinks the others. You know what I'm saying? You just get things on one, it sinks every other one. Whoa. You sit down by your table, and in the next 30 minutes, you forgot what you planned to do. Why? Emails. I get an average of 40 to 50 emails a day. 
you are, I'm behind you, I know. <laughs> Some people have more than 50 emails a day. So when I don't read them in a week, and I'm seeing 1,000, 100, 5,000, I'm like, no way. Blackberry iPhone. What iPhone doesn't pick Blackberry picks? <laughs> you need to be broken away from that thing. You need to have what I call a fast from electronics. Amen. That's the truth. You just switch it all off or put it somewhere where you never hear what it's saying and go do something else with your life, with your time. Otherwise, that thing will be a bondage to you. Is somebody hearing me here now? That thing will be a bondage. You need to say, you know what? I will not turn on my emails until this time to this time. This is the only time I'm going to listen to any email that comes after now. It's for tomorrow or later in the night. If you don't discipline yourself, that's a sure way. Now, they do it out of technology and Satan takes it to kill your time, steal your time, so you have nothing to do with where. You know what I've done? All my iPhones and my iPads are loaded with God's word. So I say, Satan, before you get me, I'll get you. <laughs> so I'm sleeping and waking up, and my iPhone is saying, Joshua chapter 2. If I'm tired of listening to Bible directly, I switch on Kenneth Hagin. Anyhow you do it, those iPhones must serve me. <laughs> Am I talking here? Yeah. But if you just leave it alone to do what he wants to do, you are in trouble. So you need to know that to be free is to let the truth come into you. And the truth does not know culture, does not know color of skin. It's just the truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. I don't care. Truth has authority. Amen. And let me inform you, if you are not willing in your heart to submit to truth, truth will not come to you. Truth can tell when you are not willing to submit. If you want to debate with truth, Jesus said, forgive. You say, how can I forgive? Jesus said, deny the flesh. You say, but I feel like enjoying myself. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow. You say, but I don't want to be seen as if I'm an odd fellow amongst my friends. You know, you're bringing up all your arguments. You know what you're doing? You're telling truth. I don't want to submit to you. And truth will say, I recognize that and I have no time for you to. So when you read the Bible, it means nothing because your internal attitude repels the truth. Is somebody hearing me here? You need to make up your mind. It's either you're going to let the truth make you free or you're going to stay in your bondage and don't blame anybody for it. So that's, you see, I told you my heart bleeds for people in problems. Are we going to take truth and let it set us free? Because truth demands process. Let me say that and we close. Truth demands what? Truth demands, but by internalizing truth, you set the process into motion. Truth can adjust you, give you a new perspective. Everybody say new perspective. new perspective. Truth will give you a new perspective about your problem. Replace error or falsehood in your heart and soul. Truth, need, truth needs time. Pay attention to it. John 15 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. When the word abides in you, prayer releases power. The power encounter is assured when truth, the word, is in the heart. Can I hear an amen? amen? So those are three things that I have given you to go and think about today. I need to be delivered if my problem has been consistently negative. I need truth to deliver me and I need to be set free. Well, you can come to the front for prayers. We'll pray over you and the power of God will set you free. But you still need truth to make you free. To make you free. Because the thing that you are in bondage to did not just come on you. It reprogrammed you. It worked inside you. It put another software in you that needs to be replaced. And let me say this about habits. Listen to this. You don't break a habit. You replace it. You don't break a habit. You replace it. And so I want to break the habit. I want to be free. No, nature abhors vacuum. If you're going to replace a habit, find another habit to replace that habit. And I want to advise you, replace every habit with the habit of prayer. It will help you. <laughs> I don't listen to my emails. I'm on the I worship God. Hallelujah. Next one hour, oh, it's time to watch my emails now. Say <laughs> amen. 
Have you received anything today? Have you received anything today? Are you ready for the reprogramming? Who will let the truth make them free? So, if I were you, I will invest in the truth. I will invest in things that will help me. Listen, guys, your future is bright, but God has to prepare you for that future. As far as God's plan is concerned, your future is bright, but there's a preparation that will take you there. If you don't give in to that preparation, I don't know what I'm going to tell you. What are the other habits you can inculcate? Soul winning, prayer habits, giving habits, all those habits are necessary. We'll talk about them later. But this is the basics. Know the truth, and the truth will make. Everybody say make. I like to be made free. We like to be made free. I wish I could just lay hands on all of you, and all of you would be made free. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like I wish it could. Just you know, the easy way out: be free in Jesus' name. I'm free. Be free in Jesus' name. I'm free. Be free in Jesus' name. I'm free. I wish it could be that easy. No, there is a making process that would dismantle something. Listen, I will never outgrow the truth making me free. I'll never. Why? Because I cannot, you know, the principle is all in the Bible. God did not drive away all the inhabitants of the land in one day. It took process. So when I'm made free in this area, there are other areas of my life I still need to be made free. So I need the truth in that area, the truth in this area, the truth in that area. So I need to be made free. There will never be a time when I'm completely free except I come like Jesus. I'm still being made free. Say amen. I need it. It's going to be a constant, lifelong developmental process. Don't let it stop at after many years of doing it. Now I know it. No, you will know something, but you now know how much you don't know in some other areas. Then you start knowing. Are you glad you came? Let's be upstanding. I think we should make some serious declarations today.